Welcome to Simple Truth Gospel with Kirian. Today we will finish 2 Thessalonians, which is chapter 3. Uh, if you miss any of our previous studies, you can always go to our website or to our SoundCloud or YouTube channel. Uh, all our teachings are posted online. Uh, but before we continue, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we gather this morning, looking for doctrine, looking for instruction, direction, light, insight into your own word. We pray that you will show them to us this morning and that you will help us to embrace them because your word is true and it has the message of eternal life. Holy Spirit of God, you are the greatest teacher. I pray that you will open the eyes of our understanding today. Give us revelation, knowledge, understanding of the truth, the word of God. As Jeremiah said, my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And have healed themselves systems, broken systems that can hold no wars. Help us, Holy Spirit, not to depart from the Word of God in pursuit of human traditions and human doctrines that Jesus Christ said makes the Word of God of no effect. Heavenly Father, Help us to work with our hands that we will have something to help those that are in need. Bless the work of our hands. Not unto us, not unto us, O Lord, but unto your name we give glory, honor, power, majesty, and dominion for everything you've done and you will continue to do. And everyone who agreed says, Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My friends, uh, we will continue our study again through the uh, second letter of uh, St. Paul to Thessalon Thessalonians. Uh, this is the last uh, chapter. So we're finishing up with that book today. Uh, before we continue, you know, like I, I've said earlier, in our previous studies, this letter was written by Paul, and he wrote this letter from Corinth during his second missionary journey with um, Silas and Luke. Also, Timothy was part of uh, his second missionary journey. We know that um, they wanted to go through uh, Britannia and as well as uh, Asia. But the Spirit of God forbade them not to go in that direction. Paul had a vision. And in that vision, he saw a man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And uh, he, they concluded the Holy Spirit was calling them in that area. So they journeyed. Uh, through uh, Macedonia, and the first city they visited was Philippi. And from Philippi, they went to Thessalonica. And uh, he spent three weeks in there. And when they got run out of town, they went to Berea, and from there to Athens, and, and, and then they went to Corinth. So this is an eschatological epistle because Paul... Uh, uh, spoke a lot about uh, the day of the Lord, which uh, begins with the rapture of the church and then the tribulation and uh, uh, the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, with this said, we are going to go ahead and start uh, 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 the chapter. Second Thessalonians verse, chapter 3, verse 1. And I read to you, brethren, finally, brethren, pray for us 
that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. So Paul puts in a prayer request. <laughs> You know, there are so many people who think that uh, the ministers, they got it all made. They don't need prayers. But uh, that is not the truth. As a matter of fact, uh, ministers, they go through more trials and uh, temptations and uh, tribulations. The enemy, the accuser of the brethren, Satan and his um, emissaries, they understand the principle that when you strike the shepherd, the flock will scatter. So because of this, uh, they oftentimes will target the minister so that they can, to the minister, cause the church to stumble. If you've been wondering, how can I pray for the ministers, I mean those that God has called into the five-fold ministry. Paul tells us, so we're going to go to them so that next time when you pray for them, because this is a continuous request. You pray for them all the time. Statistics shows that a lot of ministers quit the ministry every year. A lot of them. So we have to remember them in our prayers. So if you're wondering how can I pray for them, how do I pray for them? He tells us here. He says that the word of God will have a free course in their lives. So pray for that. Which means that they, can, they will speak the word of God boldly without any... Uh, a shame or favor or fear that they would teach the word of God instead of uh, teaching politics or human doctrines. Pray for them that uh, those who hear the word of God will be able to receive it gladly and that the word of God which they preach will go forth and bear precious fruit for the kingdom of God. Pray for them that they will remain usable. You know, there are so many ministers God called and anointed them into the ministry. But because they went in pursuit of uh, wealth, greed, lust of the flesh, they stumbled. And the anointing left them. So now, even though they stand in the pulpit, they can only make good speeches without any content or any power back in the word of God. So there is no, they don't have any effect in the lives of people. There is no power of the Holy Ghost walking with the word of God and uh, rendering results in the kingdom of God. Paul said, I keep my body under and I bring it into subjection. Least when I have preached to others, I myself might be a castaway. What is he saying? He says, I want to be the one that is principled. The one that is walking in accordance with the word of God. So that I am not swept under the carpet. So that I am not put under the shelf. So that I will continue to be usable, useful for the kingdom of God. That's what he's saying here. So we pray for them that they will not depart from the truth. That they will keep themselves uh, usable for the work of the ministry. Now in verse 2 he says, And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for not all have Faith. This is another way you pray for your ministers. That they will be delivered from unreasonable men and women. You know, in the church, there are some who are there looking for innuendos to divide the church of Christ. They are there looking for trouble. 
They are there looking for a way to bring up a false accusation against the minister so that they will, in so doing, will divide the church of Christ. There are those in the church that are, uh, uh, they have questions for the ministers, but they are not genuine questions. You know, they, 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 they start up with this question just to bring up an argument. And there are those who have gone to the extent of inflicting physical harm to the ministers of God. So Paul says, pray for us that we might be delivered from the hands of these ones. Because not all men have faith. There's another way you can pray for your ministers. In verse 3 it says, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guide you from the evil one. He says, but for you, we are praying for you. Remember, Paul will always pray for his uh, uh, audience, the, the, the saints of God. He always prayed for them. So he says, we, for you, we are praying for you because God is faithful and he is going to deliver you. When you go through your trials and tribulations, he will deliver you from the hands of the wicked one. Because he says, you got the power of the Holy Ghost at work in you. And you have Jesus Christ, the name of Jesus Christ. Because the Bible tells us that resist the devil and he will flee from you. We have the ability to resist that evil one so that he does not interfere. Anytime he shows up, we we'll put him where he belongs. He says, give no place to the devil. He says, God is faithful. And he that started a good work in you, he's going to continue this good work until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He encourages them, a thousand may fall on your side, ten thousand on your right, but it will never come close to you. Do not be afraid. When you go through your trials and tribulations, God is there with you. He says he will never cause your feet to be moved. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So Paul encourages them here to stand firm, not to be moved because God is faithful. He that dwells in the secret shelter of the Most High God will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He says, no weapons that are fashioned against you that will prosper. Any tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you will stand bold and you will condemn them. When the wicked, even your enemies and your foes, come up to eat up your flesh, Bible says they will stumble and they will fall. For he who has been born of God keeps himself, and the evil one touches him not. John tells us. So Paul encourages them here that God is faithful and he will never, never let them down. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as a Christian, in your trials and your tribulations, have this confidence that is God and he is the, we, we, they call it the God of hosts. Shabbat so he has the host of the army, armies of heaven, angels. <laughs> they will always encamp around about you and they will deliver you from every destruction. So don't be moved, child of God, <laughs> for God is in control and he will perfect those things that will, that pertains to you. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are now in verse uh, 5. Actually, we are in verse 4. I'm uh, <laughs> one verse I, <laughs> I heard. So in verse 4, it says, And we have confidence in the Lord concerning you, both that you do and will do the things we command you. Paul is able to say this about them based on their spiritual progress at this point. In 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse uh, 9, it tells us that uh, they turned to God 
from the worship of idols to serve the living God. They were able to do this because of the power of the Holy Ghost that is at work in them. Remember, in salvation, it is not the working of man. It is the working of the Spirit of God by faith. And the way we make spiritual progress is not the working of man as well, but the working of the Spirit of God. He's able to make this bold statement that they, he knows that they will not depart from the truth because the Spirit of God will continue his work. As long as you yield to his uh, leading and to his prompting, he will continue to do his work in you. Acknowledge that um, the race is not to the swift. The battle is not to the strong. So do not be braggadocious and count on your human efforts and power and strength. Always depend in the power of the Holy Ghost. And whenever you depend in the power of the Holy Ghost, you will see always that spiritual progress because the Spirit of God will be there always to lift you up and then carry you along. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 5, it says, Now may the Lord direct your heart into the love of God and into the patience of Christ. He continues his prayers for this uh, saint. Now he prays that God will continue the work of love in them. That they will continue to abound in the love of God and also in the love of one another. Because John tells us that uh, you cannot say that I love God, but you don't love the human being that you can see with your eyes. How can you say that you love God that you have not seen? So he prays that they will continue to abound in the love of God and also in the love for one another. Jesus Christ gave us commandments. He told us about the two greatest uh, commandments. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And also he says, love your neighbor as yourself. He tells us that uh, bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. So my question is this. How is this possible? You and I, we know there are some that we cannot love. We find it very difficult to love them, especially those who persecute us, especially those who have robbed us of the wrong way in the past, those who have cheated us, those who have given us so much trouble. It is difficult to love these ones. And oftentimes we will come to God crying, God, Father God, I want to love this one. I want to love them, but I, it seems that the more I try, the more I fail. This is what, sometimes when we come to God, this is what we say to him. So, where does the answer lie? Where do we find the answer to this problem? We find it in Romans chapter 5, verse 5. The love of God, the love of Christ is shelled abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit of God which is given unto us. This is the key right here. We got to depend in the power of the Holy Ghost to be able to keep the commandment of love. To be able to grow in love because love is a fruit of the Spirit. We can grow in love. But every time we depend on our own effort, we fail and then we fail again and again and again. But whenever we depend on the power of the Holy Ghost, then we are able to love one another. We are able to love God with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, with all our strength. Now the Spirit of God, the kind of love that comes 
from the spirit of God is different from the fleshly love. The love of the flesh. Completely different. The Holy Spirit gives us the agape love. Now, this is the kind of love that gives. The love that uh, made God, he, he gave us his only begotten son. For even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the kind of love that the Holy Spirit will give us. This is the kind of love that we find in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He, he, he says, this love endures all. It is a kind of love that is excited when justice is sought. It's not envious. It does not seek for its own personal selfish uh, uh, motives. This is the love, the genuine love. So this is the love that the Spirit of God will put in us. That is why it's very important that we depend on him for this kind of love. This is the only love that God will accept in our services to God, in our services to humanity. This is the only kind of God that, the kind of love that God will accept. Genuine love. For in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he tells us, he says, even if I offer myself to be burned, and I don't do it out of love, he says, it will not profit me anything. What kind of love? The genuine love of the Spirit of God, the agape love. Even if I sell everything that I got and I give the money to the poor, and the motive is wrong, he says, it will not profit me anything. That is why Jesus Christ said, in that day, some will come to me and say, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out devils, demons in your name? Have we not worked miracles in your name? And he will say to them, Depart from me. I knew you not, you worker of iniquity. Why would he say so? Because the motive was wrong. They did all these things out of ulterior motives. It wasn't out of the love of God. That is why Paul says the love of Christ constrains us. It got to be the love of Christ. Whatever we got to do for humanity, for Christ, for God, it must be motivated by the love, the genuine love of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we are in verse, um, I believe we are now in verse 6. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who works disorderly and not according to the tradition which he received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow us. For we were not uh, disorderly among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread free of charge, but walked with labor and toil night and day, that we might not be burdened to any of you, not because we do not have authority, but to make ourselves an example of how you should follow us. Verse 10. For even when you were with you, for even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. For we hear that there are some who walk among you in disorderly manner, not walking at all, but uh, are busy bodies. Verse 12. Now those who are such we command and exhort through our Lord Jesus Christ that they walk in quietness and eat their own bread. So Paul commands them here. This is a very strong statement. He says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's a command to them now. So withdraw yourself from any brother who walks in disorderliness. From the brothers who will not work with their hands. Who have so much time in their own hands. The idle ones, the busy bodies. 
Now, in First Thessalonians, we, we, we see Paul warn them. But it looks like they did not change. They continued in this mannerism. So now, he takes it to a step higher. He tells the brethren to by court, to distance, to disengage themselves from these brothers. Now, you will be doing somebody a disservice. Someone who doesn't want to work. Someone who uh, wants to be idle. You will be doing them a disservice to support them. Because what it means that you are encouraging their behavior when you render help to them. As Christians, we ought to support anyone who is incapacitated. Someone who is actively looking for a job, but they haven't found one yet. Yes, they deserve our support. We'll support them all the way. We'll help them out. But if it's someone who doesn't want to work, just want to stay idle and do nothing, then you are not helping them by supporting that behavior. That's what he's saying here. So he commands these ones here now to work. He tells them, go and find something to do. Get busy. <laughs> go out, and find something. Get busy. The Bible tells us that let he that stole steal no more. Rather, let him walk with his hands, doing that which is good, that he will have something to give that one who is in need. Now, there are benefits for walking. There are benefits. Remember the Bible tells us that God will bless the work of our hands. That is correct. But, if you refuse to do something, what will God bless? It's a question. You, you, you just think about it and then you answer it. You know, if you don't want to do anything, what will God bless? Remember, zero multiplied by zero is equals to zero. There is nothing God is going to bless. That is why the Bible tells us, despise not the day of the small beginning. Even though your beginning was small, yet your latter end shall greatly increase. When we, regardless of how small it is, once we make up our mind to engage in, 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 in physical work, it's just a matter of time. By the time you know it, you will grow from one level to another, to another, to another. It's a principle in the kingdom of God. Another benefit is when we work so that we will have something to give to other people, it opens up the door of opportunity for us, the door of God's blessings towards us. You see, the Bible tells us that give and they shall be given unto you. So when you give to other people, when you work and you support those who are really in need, it says it opens up the windows of heaven and abundance more and more and more will come to you. This is the reason, one of the reasons why we give. It's a natural law and also a spiritual law. You see, when you sow a seed in the ground, it does not come up just bearing only one seed, but it brings up abundance of harvest. That is why we must Engage in uh, walking so that we can help other people and then more will come to us and then we have more to distribute. The Bible says that is, he, that, that is it that scatters and yet increases. And that is it that uh, withholds more than its meat 
and yet it tends to penury or to poverty or to lack. What it means? The more we scatter, <laughs> the more we give, <laughs> the more we increase, the more God will bless the work of our hands. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul continues here and he tells them, use us as an example. The way you should conduct your mannerisms. He says, when we were in the midst of you, the time when we brought the gospel to you, when we ministered to you, he said, we did not command you to support us. We did not depend on you to support us. That we did not eat any man's bread without paying for it. Rather, we walked with our hands. Paul was a tent maker. And he, he walked with his hands making tents so that he could support himself and uh, the people around him. He tells them, he says, even though we have the authority to demand from you, because the Bible says, do not muscle the mouth of the ox that treaded out the wheat. He says, let him who has been taught in the word communicate back to him that teaches in every good thing. For a laborer deserves his own wages. Those that uh, 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 preach the gospel shall also live from the gospel. So they have the authority to demand for support. But they didn't go that route. Rather, they, they work with their own hands, you know, showing example the way that they should go. A good lesson for pastors and ministers. It is not a good thing to demand a, 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 a financial support from a, a young church, a church that is just started, started. Rather, there is nothing wrong for you to work a secular job until this church is able to support you. Otherwise, you will overthrow the faith of many by doing so, by demanding from them. They will depart from the truth. The main thing is for them to see the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. For them to be built up in their faith. And uh, when the time comes for them to support you fully, when that time comes, they will be able to do that. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So now we are in, um, um, we are in verse 13. But as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Very, very important scripture. Do not grow weary in doing good. You see, we live in, in a world where so many things are falling apart. We have so many uh, uh, behaviors and morals have been watered down. He tells us, he says, regardless of the things happening around you, he says, do not stop doing the right thing. That's what he's saying. And don't compare yourself by other people around you by saying, uh, 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 but everybody does it this way. Uh, this is the way the other people do it. Uh, remember, majority is not always correct. They're not always right. Bible says you do not make yourself the number or compare yourself with those who commend themselves. But they're measuring themselves by themselves, comparing themselves. Among themselves, he says, they are not wise. Regardless of the things around us, we are called to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. In antiquity, salt was used for preservation. So that uh, 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 those around you don't go to complete uh, uh, degradation. They don't go to complete corruption. We shine brighter and brighter unto the perfect day, regardless of the situations around us. A city that is set upon the hill cannot be hidden. We have the right to be in this world. 
We have the right to be among those people that we are, uh, uh, we, we cannot uh, copy what they're doing. Because the Bible says, do not be conformed to this word. Rather, be you transformed by the renewal of your heart through the word of God. So, we lead by example, regardless of what they're doing around us. We don't say, oh, we, 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 we just going to go ahead and uh, copy what they're doing. No. Because iniquity abound, Jesus Christ says, the love of many we was called. So we don't. Even though we are in this world, we are not of this world system. So we continue to stand bold, even in the times of trials and tribulations. When every other one around us is doing the wrong thing, we're going to stand bold and be the light to the world. We stand bold and be the oasis of preservation to the fallen world. We don't give in. Jesus Christ prays to the Father not to take us out of this world. Rather, he he, he prays to the Father to deliver us, keep us from the evil one. So we, we, we got to continue to be here. As we wait, the glorious appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, we continue to be the light of the world. Do not give in. Don't say everybody's doing the same thing. Everybody's doing it. No. Jesus Christ has called you out of this darkness into his own marvelous light. So be at the light of Christ in your words, in your actions, regardless of all the, of the opposition surround you. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Verse 14. And if anyone does not obey our word in this epistle, Note that person and do not keep company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So he's talking about those who walk in disorderliness. Those who will not abide by this gospel. But they are still in the church. We see them all the time. They are church members. They show up. But they are not ready to, to, to walk in uprightness. They are not ready to walk in the light. But instead, they are in the church dragging other people along with them to fall away, to depart from the truth. He says, for these ones, the ones that have continued to do this, he says, withdraw yourself from them. Jesus Christ gives us this principle in Matthew chapter 18. He tells us, if a brother offends, he says, go to him directly, privately, talk to him about it. If he says no, he says, take with you one or two more people and speak to him. If he continues to say no, he says, tell it to the church. And if he would not listen to the church, he says, you got to treat that one as a tax collector. Now, the purpose of church discipline is for restoration. That this one who has offended or who is walking in iniquity will realize that he is walking in error. And then will think about it and come back again when he is ostracized from the church. The, the principle there is to, to, to restore that brother. So that is why he says, do it in love. You know, when we uh, withdraw ourselves from them, does not mean that we don't love them, but it's an act of love. It's a way to show them that uh, 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 they are walking in the wrong path. And then they will realize, oh, oh, oh I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, it's time to turn around. And then they will repent. And then they will come back to the knowledge of the truth. And they become, you know, they walk in that light. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are now in, uh, in, in verse uh, uh, 16. And this is the closing of this letter, uh, benediction. 
uh, uh, here he says in verse 16, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. He talks about peace. Now this is the peace of God that he's talking about here. The peace that will only come when we abide in the word of God. Did you hear what I said now? I said this peace will come when we abide in the word of God. This is the peace that cannot come from having money. Friends cannot bring this kind of peace. Your position in the society cannot bring this kind of peace. This is the genuine peace of God. The, the peace that comes from within, from the Spirit of God. When we abide in the Word of God. In Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3, the Bible says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed in thee because he trusts in thee. Because of our confidence in the Word of God, because of being a doer of the Word of God, that is peace that comes from within. This abounding peace. Now, this is the peace that will surprise the hidden around you, the unbelievers. Even in the midst of turmoil, they see you walking in peace. And they are like, what is going on? He seems not to be moved in spite of all these things going around. This is the peace of Christ. The peace that no other one can give. Paul prays for this peace, <laughs> for this church, for these converts. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray for this peace in your life. The peace that will know no boundaries. The peace that will pass human understanding. That it will always abide in you, even in increasing measures. As you continue to abide in the word of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we are in verse 17. The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, so I write. Let me jog your memory. Let me refresh your memory from last week. You remember when uh, some letters went out to this sense at uh, Thessalonica stating that they are already in the day of the Lord. And these letters claim that they came from Paul himself. So Paul is making this clarification one more th once again. And he says, every letter that I have written, I sign these letters with my hands. Even when he dictates and somebody writes, at the end, he will sign the letter. So he tells them, do not pay attention to those letters you receive. He says, when it comes from me, you will know. <laughs> because I am going to put my signature at the end of it. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we are in the last verse, 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. If you notice Paul's epistles, you will see this trend. Grace and peace be multiplied in you. Sometimes he will write it in the beginning of his letter or at the end of the letter. Like here, it, we, we, we read about the peace a while ago in verse 16. And now in verse 18, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul reiterates the importance of grace as Christians. Hear me. Very important. Understand this. We ought to understand the grace of God. And not only that we understand the grace of God, we ought to live by the grace of God. What is the grace of God? Now, in a simple language, in a simple explanation, the grace of God is receiving something good from God without working for it. Very simple explanation. So, we must understand that everything we receive from God, salvation, 
the love of God to us. Because the Bible tells us while we were yet seen as Christ died for us. His forgiveness. The Bible tells us as the east is far from the west, so has he taken our iniquities away, separated them from us. His favors towards us. His mercies. They are new every morning. The Bible tells us. All of these things, they depend on grace alone, not by works. Understand it. So, you are not every day trying to depend on your own uh, uh, ability, the way you live, the good things that you do. And then you're going to say, if I do them, God is going to bless me. He's going to love me more. He's going to forgive me when I miss it. He's going to give me mercy. No, you're missing it completely. And this is why people don't have the peace of God abiding in them. Because they are living in fear. They are living their lives based on how good they are. If you want to judge it that way, the Bible tells us that all our righteousnesses are as filthy rats in the presence of God. Which means the thing that we think that we've done so much good, the thing that we think that we have perfected ourselves in, in the sight of God, it says it is a filthy rack, a menstrual cloth. That is what it is in the presence of God. So we got to understand this. That the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the grace of God is only by faith that we lay hold of it. God will not love you more or less if you miss it. No, he doesn't. Because... His love for you is unconditional and is everlasting. It does not depend on what you do. So, Paul will always tell us about the grace of God. The wonderful grace of God. Understand, my good friends, that grace is bigger than justice and the mercy. And let me use this analogy to drive home this point. The power of grace. Uh, 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 let me use a police pullover. Let's assume that you're driving your car and you're going over the speed limit and the police pulls you over and he comes to you and then he writes you a ticket and say, so you were going above the speed limit. Here is your ticket. You pay or you meet me at the court. <laughs> now, this is called justice <laughs> you got what you deserve <laughs> but let us assume now that when the police came over when he pulled you over and he came to your car instead of writing you a ticket that carries a point against your driver's license he gives you a warning ticket that doesn't have any point. Doesn't count against your driving record. And he says, so, uh, 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 go ahead and, uh, 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 and, and, and drive uh, uh, safely. Uh, don't go over the speed limit. Now, this is called mercy. Even though you dissolved a ticket. That's what the law said. But he, he, he doesn't give you a ticket. Rather, he, he had mercy on you. Now, this is mercy. But let us assume now, when the policeman showed up in your, <laughs> on, yeah, in, in your car, instead of giving you a ticket, he doesn't. Instead of giving you a warning ticket, he doesn't. But rather, he, told, he tells you about what you did wrong. And then he turns around and, and, and he puts his hand in his pocket and he brings out a, a thousand dollars. And he says, sure, I, 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 I think you should have this money. Buy yourself something and your family as well. Now this is grace. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord. This is grace now. Something that you did not deserve. But you got it anyway. <laughs> It was not dependent upon the thing that you did. <laughs> you got it anyway. 
Now, this is the way that you should look great. This is the same thing Jesus Christ did for us. God did this for us. Even though that we deserve to die. Because the Bible says the soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin is death. All have seen and fall, fallen short of the glory of God. But in spite of all these things, he gave us eternal life. Through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He said all we got to do is to believe. And whosoever believes <laughs> should not perish, <laughs> but have everlasting life. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We thank God for his own mercy. We thank God even more and more for his own grace. I've come to the end of today's teaching. My friends, if you're hearing me right now and you are not yet born again, you are not yet a child of God. You may be a member of a church, but not all the members of the churches are Christians. To be a Christian means that you are born again. Jesus Christ told Nicodemus, except the man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But the question is this, what does it mean to be born again? For some don't understand what it means. To be born again means that uh, you put aside your own effort, your own merit, your own goodness, and then you turn around 180 degrees and you depend on Jesus Christ 100%. You believe in your heart that uh, he died for your sins and you believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead. And then you ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and your Savior. And you begin a relationship with him. That's what it means to be born again. This is the only way you can do it. Through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. For he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no one will come to the Father but by me. If you are a member of other religions and you think that you can see God. You can make your way to heaven without Jesus Christ. I want to tell you that you are getting it all wrong. You cannot pick and choose the Father and then leave Jesus apart. No, you got to go to the Father through Jesus Christ because he is the express image of God. And he tells us that he is the only way to God. You cannot. There is no other way. It's as simple as that. You are the one who's going to make this decision to receive him as your Lord and your Savior and become born again. Because he says, I stand at the door and I knock. Anyone who hears my voice and he opens the door, he says, I'm going to come in and I'm going to eat with that one. And that one is going to eat with me. Which means we are free moral agents. We are the ones that will make decisions. And you are the one who will make the decision to open the door when you hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ to receive him as your Lord and your Savior. Friends, the time is very short. What are you waiting for? Just today alone, 155,000 about this number died in the world. The question is, where did they go? Now, there are only two destinations. When the spirit of someone leaves his body, is that they send up into heaven to be with God or they descend at the heart of the earth, which is hell? Those who receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior will go heaven, go to heaven. And those who refuse him will spend eternity in hell. It's a place that you don't want to go, an outer darkness, a place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place where people will be burning with fire and brimstone. So you are the one who's going to make the call today. When you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation. For now is the time. Now is the time, the accepted time to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior. People are going to hell for one reason alone. The rejection of Jesus Christ. For the light came, but men are still walking in darkness. For men are condemned because they refuse to believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So good friends, 
He that has the Son of God has life. But he who does not have the Son of God, the Bible tells us, he shall not see life. As a matter of fact, the wrath of God abides in that one. You don't want to do that. You don't want to miss heaven and spend eternity in hell. The days of man is very, very short. The days are very short. You don't want to walk in darkness. The light has already come. It's here now. You have to receive this uh, good news. That's why we call it the gospel. It's good news. It, it, it doesn't require you to do anything to work for it. It's a free gift of righteousness. All you do is you receive it by faith. And now you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And all your sins will be washed away. And you will become the righteousness of God. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am going to lead you now into the prayer of salvation. And if you pray this prayer with all your heart, you will right now become a child of God. Pray this prayer with me. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ. And I believe he is your son. He died for my own sins. You raise him up from the dead on the third day. Dear Jesus, I ask you to come into my life this day. Be my Lord and my Savior. I believe by faith that I am now born again. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Father, I give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Congratulations if you pray that prayer. Now find a very good church where they teach the word of God and become a member of that church so that you can grow in your faith. For the only way that you can grow in your faith is through the word of God. Buy a Bible, study the word of God, that the spirit of God will give you revelation and knowledge and understanding of the scriptures so that you will always desire the sincere milk of the word of God so that you may grow thereby. I want to thank our partners all over the world, those that are helping us spread the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much. God will continue to bless you. Good friends, remember, it is only those who hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and they put them in practice. These are the ones who get the benefits of the word of God. I pray for you this day. May the Lord bless you and be with you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you strength and give you peace in the midst of turmoil and uh, give you divine health and give you prosperity, supply your needs for you and give you revelation, knowledge and understanding, desire to always abide in the word of God. And bless the, bless your weak. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, remember, surely there is an end. And your expectation will never be cut off. Oh, blessed be the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Send la cola balute. Oh, ragangranda majeri karabata. Oh, baru Hashem. Mana ungrodosko bure keda bar keske tun turunkushu. Agaramans de fledis kurukusko brushke tala ala maje yara papati yara pato. Vendem ne grandem skuko brukoto. Ajakin grandem sabla prade.